When you open the door to the spirit world using a Ouija board, you just never know what might come through. Tonight, I'll share with you a few cautionary tales. So sit back, relax, let me lead the way, and let's get scared together, 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 together. I know there are a lot of people out there who are very skeptical, but I would strongly advise you to stay away from a Ouija board. I had to learn that lesson the hard way. My story begins when I was 13 years old. I had a very abusive aunt that lived in New Orleans and practiced black magic. Even though she was family, she was very mean and overall a very toxic person to be around. She would beat on my cousins and me and curse at us for no reason. My aunt was into some pretty weird stuff. She owned an antique store in New Orleans and had a living space right underneath it. She had a collection of human skulls and used to adorn them with candles and decorate her apartment with them. They were set up all throughout her home. My grandmother thought she was dangerous and she didn't like when I'd go to visit her. One day, my aunt had a pretty bad stroke and she had to start using a wheelchair. She had a chairlift installed so she could get from her living quarters up to the shop or outside whenever she needed. When Hurricane Katrina was coming, my family tried to get her to come to Georgia to stay with us and be safe, but she wouldn't leave the shop. She said, I ain't afraid of a little bit of water. But when the storm did come, all the power in her building went out, and without power, the chairlift stopped working. She got stuck under the shop when the water rose, and she ended up drowning, still sitting in her wheelchair. Now, here's where the story really begins. My uncle traveled from Georgia down to New Orleans to get the stuff out of the shop once the waters receded. Most of it had been taken by looters, but there were some personal items remaining. When my uncle got back to Georgia, we went through all of her things. I was living with my aunt and uncle there at the time. The house they lived in was on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. As my cousin and I went through the bags, we ran across my aunt's Ouija board. When she was alive, she used to yell and curse at us if we ever touched it. We didn't know what it was at the time. We assumed it was for kids because it had a bunch of letters and numbers on it. My uncle was a fireman, and one day he had to work the overnight shift. So my cousin and I thought it would be a really good idea to play with the Ouija board when no adult was around to stop us. We read the instructions, and it said that we could communicate with spirits and summon loved ones who had passed over. So I came up with the amazingly brilliant idea of trying to contact our abusive late aunt. We asked the board to summon our aunt so we could talk to her, and right after we said that, the power in the house went out. Now we lived in the middle of nowhere, so it was pitch black because we didn't have any street lights out our way. We both started screaming and hid under the bed. After we hid, things got unnaturally quiet. I had a cell phone that I'd left in the kitchen. I wanted to call my uncle to come be with us, but I first needed that phone. And it was a pretty big house, so I would have had to walk like a hundred feet in the dark to get it. But my cousin insisted that I go get that phone. I figured if I ran the whole way, it wouldn't be so bad. So I got out from under the bed, and I was getting ready to run to the kitchen, when somebody started knocking on the front door. Now remember, we lived in the middle of nowhere. My cousin said it might be the ice maker. But I said, how can it be the ice maker when the power is out? Then the knocking got louder. Now we both knew it wasn't the ice maker. So my cousin said, go see who it is. I swear to God I wanted to smack him for that one. At that point, whoever was at the door started banging super loud like they were trying to break in. I don't know where I got the balls to do it, but I ran to the kitchen to grab my phone, and then I ran to the door and called out, Who is it? And at that moment, the banging stopped. 
I grabbed my phone and turned on the flashlight. My cousin was now standing behind me, using a swimming pool noodle as a weapon. I was so scared I didn't even take the time to call him a dumbass for that one. We were terrified and went back to hide under the bed. The house was still pitch black, and I was trying to call my uncle, but his phone kept going straight to voicemail. My cousin was trying to get my attention, but I told him to shut up. I didn't want whoever was outside to hear us and know where we were hiding. But then, my cousin pointed to the window. There was somebody peeking through the window. A face was pressed right up against the glass, and it was so smushed up that I couldn't make out who or what it was. My heart was beating so fast, I really thought I was going to pass out. My cousin started crying, and I put my hand over his mouth and told him to be quiet. Whoever was at the window was clawing and scratching at it. Then, in the creepiest voice I ever heard, it said, I can see you. I grabbed my cousin by the shirt and pulled him out from under the bed, and we ran to the next room. I didn't look back but I heard screaming and banging coming from the window as we ran. When we got inside the room, I locked the door and we hid inside the closet. My uncle had a rifle in there, but I didn't know how to use it. Then I noticed a breeze in the dark room, and I realized the window was open. I was so scared I literally couldn't move. I knew I had to close that window, but I sure didn't want to go near it. I couldn't hear the banging anymore, and I thought maybe whoever it was left. But then my cousin said, maybe they're just moving to this side of the house. And I knew he was right. It could have been that too. So I ran over to the window with the rifle in hand, even though I didn't know how to use it, and I tried to close the window as fast as I could. But it's an old house and the window was stuck, and it took a good amount of strength to close it. My uncle has a large field right in front of the house, and as I struggled to close the window, I noticed there was somebody standing right at the edge of that field. I shined the flashlight out towards the field, but before I could see who it was, they started running towards me at breakneck speed as I was still struggling to close the window. I put down the phone and pointed the shotgun, and I just started pulling the trigger over and over again. But it didn't fire. The person was like ten feet away from me now, and closing in fast. So what did I do? My dumbass threw the rifle out the window at whoever it was, and my cousin and I ran into the living room. So I guess my cousin using the pool noodle as a weapon was not the dumbest thing to take place that night. At that point, I had pretty much accepted the fact that we were both about to die, because I left the window open and gave whoever was menacing us the rifle. I just knew whoever or whatever it was was about to kill us. I told my cousin I loved him and hugged him and said goodbye. Then, in the middle of the hug, I saw lights outside. Headlights! I looked out and there was a huge truck parked in the yard. It was the old white guy who lived on the other side of my uncle's property. He and his wife had come to see if our electricity was out too. The two of us flew out the door to the truck, and we told him everything in about seven seconds flat because we were talking so fast. He told us to stay in the truck with his wife, and he pulled out a gun and went in the house. As a little black kid... I had never been more excited to see an old white guy in my entire life. I then noticed that the window in the room we had just left was now closed. I told his wife that somebody was definitely in the house now because that window was open just moments ago. She started screaming to her husband to get out of the house, but he wasn't answering. So she dialed 911 and had them send every available officer in town out to help us. The old man finally came out and ran back to the truck. We drove over to his house and waited for the police there. 
After many attempts, I finally got through to my uncle, and he showed up just when the police did. They searched the entire house and found nothing. No sign of a forced entry, no scratches on the windows, no fingerprints, no one hiding inside. The only thing they did find was a lot of water on the floor in the hallway. They asked us if we had been playing in water, and we said no. We had no idea where that water came from. We told the police the whole story, but they treated us like we were just two little kids that scared themselves. But I know what I saw. My uncle took us with him to sleep at the fire station that night. And the next morning, my uncle and a few of the other firemen went back to the house. They went inside and got the Ouija board, took it out front, and burned it. My uncle and his wife got a preacher to bless the house, but I still don't like going in there. That was by far the most traumatic thing I've ever been through. I'm 26 now, and I still remember everything that happened that night when I was 13. I really don't want to believe that it was my late aunt who did it all. I know she was mean, but did she really want to kill us? I prefer to think that it was a demon or evil spirit, but I still can't explain why the police found all that water on the floor. Maybe it was her. After all, she did drown, so that would explain the water. I recall talking to my uncle the day after it happened. He said when he found the rifle, the safety was off and it was fully loaded too, which means it should have fired. I still think about it every single day. This happened when I was 16 years old. It was New Year's Eve, and my parents had a party to go to. So my older brother, his girlfriend, and our older sister all came over to ring in the New Year with me. After watching the ball drop on TV, we were kind of looking for things to do. I suggested using the Ouija board. At first, we contacted a spirit that claimed to be named Naomi. My sister remembered that our great-grandmother's middle name had been Naomi, and she went by her middle name. But nothing momentous or scary happened when we spoke to Naomi. After a while, my brother's girlfriend and our sister got tired, and they decided to crash for the night. But my brother and I chose to stay up and play with the board. It was around three in the morning, and at first, we didn't connect to anything. Then the planchette began to move on its own. We asked, Who are you? It spelled out, Eugene. Now, that seemed like a really unlikely and nerdy name for a spirit, so we laughed. We asked it, Why are you contacting us, Eugene? And it spelled out, Afraid. Well, that seemed a bit more serious. So we asked him, Why are you afraid? It replied, Music, 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 over and over again. Then it started pointing to the same three numbers. My brother had the idea to turn on the radio and try to find a station with those call numbers and letters. And to our surprise, there really was a station there. The song Stranded by the group Heart was playing. The board immediately started spelling out, Heart, Afraid, Heart, Afraid, over and over again. I thought my brother was just teasing me. Then it started saying, Don't go. Don't leave me. Don't go. Church. Church. Afraid. Don't go. Over and over and over. We assured Eugene that we weren't going anywhere. Then, it just stopped making any sense. And at that point, we decided to leave the board alone and put it away for the night. The next day, the phone rang. Our father picked it up. It was our grandmother calling to say that her brother Eugene, who lived in Arizona and my brother and I had never met, had a heart attack the night before. Apparently, he had flatlined several times and died on the operating table, and they kept bringing him back. My brother and I were just amazed, 
and we told our dad the entire story when he hung up. A day or two later, my grandmother called to update my dad, and he told her the story. She was absolutely stunned, and she said that when Eugene had regained consciousness, the first thing he said was that he was so afraid for his soul because he hadn't been to church in over 20 years. It was almost as if my brother and I had been some sort of lifeline for him that night. I myself am firmly agnostic. I don't know what's out there, but I do know, thanks to this experience, that there is something out there. I've been fascinated by the paranormal ever since. Back in high school, I was over at my friend's house, and her mother was telling us about the building she worked in. The place was supposedly haunted, because it was the location of a brutal murder years before. Since her mother worked in the building and had keys, we all decided to go there late one night with the Ouija board and try to contact whatever spirit happened to be there. I had never used one before, so I was a bit skeptical. The building was essentially a large warehouse with tall metal racks that went up to the ceiling. They held large bags of dirt, manure, bark, tools, ceramic pots for plants, and other landscaping things. Think Costco or Home Depot for the landscaping set. The Ouija board we used was glow-in-the-dark, so we kept the lights off in the warehouse for atmosphere. Once we got going, the planchette started moving around all on its own, and I was already freaking out. We asked if somebody was there to let us know, and we heard a loud bang that seemed to come from the rafters on the other side of the warehouse. Every question was met with a similar bang from various locations throughout the warehouse, sometimes close to us and sometimes far away. The final thing we asked was, Do you mean us any harm? But the planchette didn't move, so we repeated the question again. And this time, it was followed by the closest, loudest noise that we'd heard yet. It sounded like it was right on top of us, so we decided it was time to leave. As we were rushing out, we flipped on our cell phone flashlights and saw that two large pots had fallen from the racks and a 40-pound bag of bark and dirt had also fallen to the ground. Then, we started to hear a slow, low grinding noise, but we didn't know what it was. When my friend's mother returned to work the next day, she discovered that a sledgehammer had been dragged through the dirt and bark that covered the cement floor. The strange part? It was standing straight up in the middle of the debris, and there were drag marks from the sledgehammer, but no footprints anywhere. That experience pretty much made me believe in ghosts, and I slept with the light on for about a week. Two friends and I tried to contact my grandfather with a Ouija board about 15 years ago, but it didn't work, though we did contact a spirit. The planchette started to move around, and the spirit claimed to be my friend's father, who had died a few years before we met her. When she heard that, she let go of the planchette, so it was just me and my other friend manning the board. To verify that it was him, she asked his middle name and birthday, and the board got the information right. So we asked if he had something to say to his daughter. He just spelled out the word L-O-V-E. Then the planchette just kept making the infinity symbol again and again. At that point we called it quits because the girl started crying profusely, so we put the board away. About a week later, I saw my grandfather in a dream. I said to him, I tried to contact you with a Ouija board. He replied, I know, but we decided to let the other guy get through because he had to tell his daughter that he would love her forever. Then I woke up.
My first year in college, some friends and I started playing with a homemade Ouija board made of paper. We contacted some spirit whose name I've thankfully forgotten. As we were talking to it, the doorbell rang, and one of our friends had to go because her dad was there to pick her up. After she left, we stopped playing, but we didn't close out the session by saying goodbye to the spirit like you should. We just threw the paper away. A few days later, the girl that left early started acting strangely, and she stopped hanging out with us. Months later, she told us that she had to have a cleansing from a psychic because she wasn't feeling like herself anymore. The moment she stepped through the door, the psychic told her that she had a spirit attached to her and she used the very same name that was spelled out on the Ouija board months before. She told our friend that this spirit was following her because we hadn't closed the session properly. She attempted to cleanse her, but she was never able to get rid of that spirit. Our friend became distraught and ended up dropping out of college and attempted suicide three times. She then moved away to another state and we've lost touch. Ouija boards are no joke, people. I have a Ouija board story that happened to my uncle. He attended a Bible college in the early 1960s in Southern California. My uncle's friend was in the dorm room and two of his fellow classmates were asking the Ouija board questions. It was actually working. They were receiving some pretty intriguing answers to their questions. Then his friend's roommate came home, and the moment he walked through the door, the planchette stopped working, just like that. They kept asking, Hey, where did you go? Why did you stop answering us? And the planchette slowly spelled out, He has the blood of Christ on him. The roommate who had arrived home was a born-again Christian, whereas the others present were, shall we say, just going through the motions of their faith. My uncle's friend was so struck by this experience, he became a true believer. Since this was not my own experience, I can't really vouch for it. But I will say, my uncle is a very serious man, and he's not one to tell tall tales. So this story always stuck with me. While stationed in Germany in the early 2000s, a group of friends and I decided to play the Ouija board in our military barracks. After joking around for a bit, we started to ask more serious questions. We eventually contacted a teenage girl named Cheryl. She told us she was looking for her boyfriend. She said that they died when they were driving back home from a Grateful Dead concert and crashed their car. They both died, but she hadn't been able to find him on the other side. She told us his name and asked if we could find him and get them together again. Eventually, we did make contact with him, and when we asked if he knew Cheryl, he said yes. He said to tell her that he loved her and he regretted not being able to be with her, and he missed her a lot. The final thing he said was tell her I'm sorry. Then he stopped communicating with us. After unsuccessfully trying to get in touch with Cheryl and her boyfriend again, we finally contacted the spirit of an older woman. She seemed really sweet and said she knew Cheryl. When we asked her why she wasn't with her boyfriend, she said, Because Cheryl is in heaven and her boyfriend is in hell. As soon as she said that, all the candles in the room went out at the same time. We all got pretty freaked out and put the board away. We never really talked about it after that night. It's been well over 10 years now, and it still freaks me out every time I think about it. I had a Ouija board and we used to play with it a lot. The spirit that always came through was named Paul. He said he was 18 years old when he died. 
Apparently, he died in my hometown in the 1800s, and he said his mother was the one who killed him. He started getting obsessive with me. My initials are KLM, and if anyone else was playing the board and not me, he would just keep pointing to the letters KLM over and over again until I'd talk to him. He told me that his mother was in hell for killing him, and I had to get her out. He said there was a guy named Logan, a priest in the Midwest. He told me that this man was God's helper, and that I was the only one on earth that could find this man to give her help to get out of hell. He told me that he would be inside me till the day I died, and then we would be together for all eternity. I gave the Ouija board away after that, and ever since then... If I'm even near one now, Paul is there asking for me. For the record, I think Paul's full of crap, but I refuse to even be in the same room with the Ouija board now. Thank you so much for listening tonight and for being part of my family of darkness. I appreciate every single one of you. Now click or tap on the screen above to hear more stories like this so you can stay scared until we meet again, my friends.